a very exciting time for the two people that I'm sitting with today. Elizabeth Strepp has been a very controversial and provocative choreographer for almost her entire career. And Catherine Gunn, who I first met in ACT UP, um, has made one of my favorite AIDS films. I've said this to you before, but uh, and it's a little known one, but it, it, it very much relates to this film because it's about community. You know, and I think that the dance company in, in Born to Fly is also about community, internally and externally. I wanted to ask Elizabeth, I want you to go back to when you were a little girl, and do you remember when you realized that you were being told you could not fly? Well, I remember it was frowned upon, and I always thought falling was flying. So whenever I would be clumsy or knock a bunch of things down and hit the ground, people would get upset because you had to clean it up. Flying and moving in general is messy. So I do remember that. The parents tend to be very worried, and, and, uh, and I know that Catherine, you have a family, are very worried when their, their kids fall or, or seem to be in danger. In your family growing up, were you sort of cons constrained or constricted about what you physically could do? No, no, they were pretty much not really paying attention. You know, uh -huh. the door would open in the morning, you'd go out either to school or to play for the whole day. But I remember doing things like one time a box of nuts and bolts was sliding slowly off the kitchen cabinet and we were all sitting at the table. And I immediately thought, oh, this will, I didn't say, oh, this will make a great dance. But I got up stealthily, walked over, did a spin and caught it half inch from the ground. And that one bolt went out and my parents turned around stunned. Consciously or unconsciously? I just did it because I, I thought, well, it's going to fall and go all over the place. I think I'll go over there and catch it. But I, then I thought, let's catch it the second before it hits the ground. Oh, I thought it was, uh, the, uh, this is sort of to Catherine too, uh, uh, one of the things about being a kid and when you realize what the boundaries are physically of what you can or cannot do, and comic books and now TV and children's programming, it shows kids a lot of things that, in fact, they can't do uh, in, in, in life. So the whole reality of danger uh, and flying and jumping and doing physical things that makes a parent's heart sort of stop in observation, but the child is having fun. Where do you draw that line? Well, I think, I mean, it's interesting because I think Elizabeth does it too, and people talk and focus for many good reasons a lot on injuries and accidents that happen, but Elizabeth's work as a choreographer is really to create a situation where those things do not happen or to minimize them. And that was my approach to parenting and I think is part of why our collaboration was so powerful on this movie because I, you know, I've talked about this, but I never told my kids not to use sharp knives. As soon as they wanted to cut vegetables, I taught them how to use a knife. And that's part of your fitness so they could do about it. food. Yeah, well, exactly, back there. Or even chopping wood. They saw the axe. They want to use the axe. I didn't say, no, you can't use the axe. And I also didn't say, go ahead, just go use the axe. I said, you stand with your feet apart. You hold it with you. You do this, you do that. So they could do it. Same with lighting fires. Everybody says, you know, don't, don't play with matches. So I encourage my kids to play with matches when they were really young. We'd have fire pits. We still have fire pits outside. They learn to make fires. They can make the fire. They know where the rocks are. They know where the fire creek. They know so where water fact, is. They know how to do it. And they're fascinated. Who's not fascinated with fire? So just telling them, prohibiting it, and saying, no, 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 you can't jump off that wall. That's why people are so into this, um, what do they call it now, where they run around through the city up and over things. Parkour. And parkour. Yeah. I mean, the kids do that naturally. Mm -hmm. So they're going to run up and jump up on the stone wall and run along and jump down. I mean, all kids want to jump over the parking meter. You don't want them to land on their heads, so they got to learn how to do it and in some scenarios have some padding. But they learn. That's what pop action is. So I think it's an approach to risk and danger that says embrace it and try it, but don't, you know, we both wear seatbelts. Like... Why would you not do that, right? Okay. I want to go back a bit. Um, thank you uh, for the parenting. <laughs> really good. So anyway, uh, and because, bring your kids to this movie. Yeah. That, I mean, I think of well, it I as think a family I, I, film. I, 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 this is yeah. definitely a family film, yeah. uh, Born to Fly, and it's a film that kids will love. Yeah. Uh, but I want to go back, Elizabeth, to when you first came to the city and you first self-consciously realized that you were going to be a dancer. Mm -hmm. When was that? Well, I, I, real, I made that decision at age 17 when I went to State University of New York at Brockport. And I was an artist, 
I was called Rembrandt too when I graduated from eighth grade because I could draw, mm -hmm. and I thought I'm an artist. That was my identity, and I was also a physical person. I did um, varsity basketball, baseball at Our Lady of Mercy High School in Rochester. So to me, but I was more obsessed with action. Always, movement was my passion. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't. I was really good at drawing and painting, but I didn't enjoy the activity. So I started training at 17. And major when you dance. say training, what do you mean by training? Taking dance classes and formally training my body okay. as a dancer mm -hmm. from 1967, um, 68, all the way to 1995 mm -hmm. when I was 45. Mm -hmm. um, so when I came, and then I went to San Francisco, and then I wanted to choreograph eccentric acts. Mm -hmm. you know, that was my thing, but um, you do that by training your body first. So you were you were uh, here in New York when the Judson uh, dance people were around, and Steve Paxson was climbing walls, and Tisha Brown was using space in an unusual way. I was I missed Judson by a minute, but I I was here in time for Grand Union, and mm -hmm. all of the early choreographers Tisha Brown, David Gordon, Steve mm -hmm. Paxton, um, Contact Improv. He invented Let's talk it. about Contact Improvisation okay. uh, and how that. When you first saw it, because that's a physical impact in a way that dancers are not nor certainly classical dancers are not trained for. Sort of, you know. But to me, it was uh, Im not really impact. It was taking each other's weight. So there was a lyricism to contact mm -hmm. in in improv that I um, wasn't that interested in. With so it's different respect. from slam dancing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You really have to hit with a lot of velocity with slam dancing, and I also felt that the carefulness that was. Um, orchestrated in mm -hmm. every dance scenario was a class thing, mm -hmm. was about not getting hurt. Mm -hmm. They didn't even occur to them, I don't think, to do a rough move where they would have to, in the end, take the hit that gravity provides. In your company, um, <coughs> there are men and women, uh, but it seems to be very gender-free in terms of the dancing. Uh, it's one of the things that most struck me about watching the company. Uh, the, the, the women are very assertive and, you know, as fearless as the men. And the men almost tend to be a little softer in a way. In the company, there's a balancing out of this kind of energy that I haven't seen uh, in any other dance company. And I'd like you to uh, talk about that and how conscious you are of that when you are auditioning or testing or whatever the word is that you use to put a person in your company. Sure. Um, gender is an issue that, yes, you know, I, one, we all know now there's more than two genders. Mm -hmm. So my impulse to ignore it, I think, was well-intentioned well and accurate. And I think that I like to have even numbers, because I think too much estrogen or too much testosterone upsets the balance of humankind. Um, but I also think that um, the notion of telling a story about gender, identity politics, which is really, really present in downtown experimental dance a lot. Yeah. I just don't think that's... Almost what we, too much at this uh, point. Yeah, I, I mean, everything I say criticizes dance, but I'm really doing uh, an analysis of how I think presenting action theatrically can be most effective, and I think it's been unexamined in a deep way, rather than always trying to tack something on, like story or gender or emotionalism or music. How about dealing with the form of action first. And I think that's what my, my premise always has been about what can action do to incite an audience. What's the iambic pentameter of action? Not music, not literature, not poetry. And I think we have so much work to do there. So I've never been interested in like, let me tell a story about what it's like to be a woman. Who cares? Mm -hmm. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Or a man. I don't know about a man. I'm sort of half and half now. But, it, but it's clear in your company that there's no boundary set about who can do what. Correct. Absolutely not. No. And, uh, and, and that's one of the things that's quite exciting when you watch this film, uh, that you see that that is not an issue. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. And you see a woman landing right under... I mean, we often get questions about, doesn't it hurt your breasts or, for the men, your genitals? No, it doesn't, if you land right. Because you, know, you realize it, your pecs take the hit and your quads take the hit. So. What, what, what intrigues me as a non-dancer and someone that a lot of what you do is, is, oh my God, it's sort of like what Grotowski said about acting in the 60s. Grotowski said, the audience has to believe that you're doing something that is impossible to do. 
And you can only do that through clear discipline. I mean, I, I, I was in a workshop with him with, oh. with, in the 60s. And, yes. and I see it in your work, too. Um, uh, when we as an audience go into the film or go into a performance, it's like full of, it's like a trapeze act in some ways. You know, oh my God, what are they doing? And how, but then stepping back, I see this incredible discipline of choreography. And can you talk about how the discipline frees your dancers to be fearless? Sure. I mean, practice makes perfect, and we do our moves. That's why it's not a skill that's required that the dancers memorize. Like, you go into a Twilight Thar audition, you mm -hmm. have to memorize mm -hmm. eight phrases of movement like this. We repeat our actions thousands of times. And when you see The Forces show now, and it's four years old, the theatrical show we have, mm -hmm. um, you realize, I couldn't have told them to do that. The timing has condensed, condensed. It's sooner, harder, faster, higher, all around, taking this kind of digitalized singularity of action, and it's like an explosion. So I think that the notion of that, that practicing, the audience... You, you might be able to do one of those moves as a soloist if you're a gymnast, but you could never mix it up with nine other people. See, that's, that's interesting. You just said if you're a gymnast, and some people say, oh, that's gymnastics. But like, Polybus? How do you say that other dance Pilates. company? Pilates. 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 Yes. You know, the, the, so again, about magic of, oh my God, what are they, how do they do that? Yeah. Uh, what is the difference between a dancer in the strep company and a gymnast who's training for the Olympics. Okay, well, the first distinction between those two issues is gymnasts are soloists. And you can do a whole lot of things with your own body if you're not interrupted with five other bodies. So that would be the main thing. And also, they, in general, gymnasts aren't great at putting one move after another after another. They kind of stop, break, mm -hmm. stop, break, stop, break. So their capacity in all those hundreds of years of training that dancers have, and so do gymnasts, but gymnasts are doing the big muscle moves most of the time. Mm -hmm. And so when you just want someone to walk out and turn, it's clumsy. It's weirdly odd. And my dancers have training in dance, in figuring out timing that is not about just themselves or not about music. It's about this other crazy thing. So it's about company? It's about company, yeah. And um... The team. The, the, uh, or rather, you prefer the word team. It is more of a team. It's more of a yeah. team. The, uh, let's go to the film for a moment. Um, I mean, there's so much in this film that is exciting to watch and see, just as an audience. You know, at some point I thought I was in a Tom Cruise action film, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. Which, No, which is, um, uh, which, 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 is uh, which is exciting because you lose, because it's a very artful um documentary, well edited and crafted, all those elements are there. But the sense of wonder, which your company always brings to people, I think, Catherine, that you were able to capture that in going on this trip to London, essentially. And I th how did you um, overcome your own sort of like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? I mean, from, a, from an artistic or director's point of view, as opposed to Elizabeth's point of view, which is, oh my God, <laughs> let's climb this building. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I took a lot of my cues, especially in London, from Elizabeth. And she was very open, is incredibly, and surprisingly to me, really open to what's happening. She's already talked about it here, that she can't necessarily control in many scenarios, what's happening, especially on these public pieces. So they had never jumped off the Millennium Bridge before they jumped off the Millennium Bridge. And so Elizabeth didn't exactly know what was going to happen. And even that night before there were supposed to be uh, 18? Mm -hmm. 18 dancers on bungee cords on the Millennium Bridge. And because of all the rains, the riggers couldn't get up more than seven. And then it ended up being perfect that it was seven. It was in both of our opinion, way better than it would have been at 18. So I had, in London, we had five camera people, including Al Mazels, which was a real treat. Now, where did you have really Al Mazels? Loved. Now, where was Al Mazels? Did you know he was there? <laughs> you know, yes, you know yes, I did know. But where was he sitting? Did he, did he, did he have Very a camera in, in hand, oh, yeah. and did he climb up? Uh, he did him? not climb, and he did sit. <laughs> but he would decide where he wanted 
Albert said, May is one of our oldest and still working cinematographers and directors in the film business and has mentored so many of two or three generations of quality filmmakers. So, and created the notions of direct cinema with other people where mm-hmm. you just pay attention. I could go on and on about Al these days and the importance. If you haven't seen Salesman in a while, you should go watch that again. Because not only does it tell a story in real time of working class people going door to door trying to sell these Bibles to people who don't have two pennies to rub together, who are, you know, could, the women who are the ones who are at home. Anyway, this story goes on. Everyone's trying to survive, but what's fascinating is that you see interactions between people that don't exist anymore. Because now we're sold stuff. You drive down the street. I have to walk by every day a huge billboard of Calvin Klein naked people laying there with my little children every day and explain to them. And the people who made that ad do not have to see my face and my kid's face. And what our, So in this movie, you see these interactions between people. And Al is about patience and watching and letting things just it's, happen it's, it's and in, being there. It's interesting you talk about him in this way because... Uh, both of you have a reputation for being very much in control and in charge of what you do. You know? and, and, and when you talk about direct cinema, or I don't know what the term would be in choreography, but that kind of moment of, 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 of frisson that happens in time. Uh, you know, how did you surrender, particularly Catherine, to, oh, I have to let go. You know, the rain is here, the wind is here, everything I planned is not going to be in place. Uh, what happens at that moment as a, as a director for you? Well, to me, and partly because Al's been in my mind and a, a, in, you know, a mentor to me for so many years, but also that I never wanted to do narrative. A lot of people start in documentary film on their way to making their first film, mm-hmm. their first narrative, and that's where they're headed. Those, to me, are two completely different things. I'm just... I, I don't want to... I may be controlling in other areas, but I don't want to control the script. I don't want to control the story. And frankly, we didn't know what the narrative was to this film until we did our final interview with one of Elizabeth's former dancers. We we had London. We had incredible archival footage. I can't imagine ever making a movie without archival footage again because there's so much footage now that everybody's making images every day. And there's a quality to things that were made more than 15 years ago that you can't get today. but So we had all this material, but the question was, how will we get viewers to surrender to the experience of London without first mediating their own response in terms of their fear that someone's going to get hurt or their resentment that there's this risk Elizabeth is putting herself and her dancers at. How did you do that? And I, mean, I feel how did that, you do that we did it with Deanne. And so you have this whole story you establish. Elizabeth is a genius, brilliant choreographer and artist, somebody who comes along. You start to see in the middle of the film the toll that this takes on the practitioners, the dancers, Mm -hmm. and Elizabeth herself. And you start dealing with your fear. Everybody's coming in going, isn't someone going to get hurt? Someone's going to get hurt. Whether we admit it or not, it's in everybody's mind when they go to Elizabeth's work. And then we say, yes, in fact, these are the kinds of things that happen. You go to the doctor, you go to the chiropractor, this and that. And then Deanne happens, and Deanne gives us that interpretation where she says she wouldn't go back, she wouldn't change it, because you have to grab magic when you can. And she uses that word, which isn't a word I used to use much, but once this film was made, I embrace it, because it, you know, whether you call it love or magic or art or whatever it is for any one of us, religion. What about trust? But Trust. I mean, that'll come up. But what happens is that then, yeah, if you trust, I mean, from the bowling ball, the inception of the movie was you trusting me to drop it, me trusting Zaire to catch it, and then I came off, and us trusting each other to make this movie. But I feel like with the Deanne story, and there she is, she is a whole person, and she's had all this experience in her life. She said she there's something she didn't have before Streb, there's something she had at Streb that she hasn't had since, and then we go to London, and I just feel people surrender, that they're just open at that point. They're like, well, the, okay, I get it. And then they can just watch and be in the moment of London. There's a moment in the film um, when nothing seems to be going as it anticipated. <laughs> and um, 
I, I, I wanted to say mama. It's strange that that's the word that comes <laughs> rather than papa. <laughs> but, or, you know, but it, 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 the film suddenly goes to Elizabeth, who you can, I could see trying to figure out what do I do next year? And how do I let my children, if I may use that term, or my team better? My team know it's okay regardless. We will just adapt to nature. Right. Right. A, and tell, what is that moment like for you? Well, you know, there have been, like when I was on the, uh, in the basket at the hub of the London Eye, even the rehearsal Wednesday and Thursday prior to that Sunday mm -hmm. in July 2012, and it was the first time we were attaching them to the spokes. I was here in the basket, and my rigger was up there, standing on the on the hub, where no human should be. And he had invented this hardware that the, the sleeves go around mm -hmm. the spokes, and there's ropes to the rim and to the hub, and there's brakes and releases. Who is he? He is Robin Elias. He is part of Unusual Hardware. He's Unusual the, Hardware. That's unusual a... Hardware. And he is a man I've used from then on. I don't, I don't, there are people here in America, but I, I fly him in for everything, even going down Bergdorf Goodman's Christmas windows, brought him in. Um, and I'm thinking, as I'm watching them go, and it's going, they have to get on while it's moving, and as it got to be about three or four, the fifth person, and their little bodies, you know, I was thinking, this is wrong. This is too much to ask, and I think maybe it's mentioned in the film, but I, inside of me, I was like, but there's nothing I can do now. Should I stop it now? You know, but well, you there's nothing a, I can do to stop Your team has particular characteristics, though. They seem to all be uh, uh, risk-takers, thrill-seekers, and endorphin experiencers. And, yeah. and that, that all seems to be part of what keeps them, even when they say they were frightened. I mean, at one yeah. point, they, they, you know, jumping off of the bridge, not having, in, because of the weather conditions, not having a lot of rehearsal on it. There was that moment, and I think it all comes from you. Well, it does come for me, and don't forget, like, we jumped off the bridge for the first time, but we were on in Amer America for a year before that, you know, practicing going up and down on bungees for 18, 20 minutes, which uh -huh. you don't do with a bungee. Uh -huh. Bungee's made for a single two-second yeah. jump. Yeah. But the stamina for that, they were prepared. My, my team, my producers in London, had made a mimic of the Millennium Bridge in Galleon's Reach at our rehearsal, massive garage, and outside... And so we've been doing it from the height. Everything was the same. So my job is to prepare those dancers so when they're on that spoke or they're ready to jump, they understand why they're not going to fall, mm -hmm. they understand the vocabulary. The situation is not the same. And that's what is the unknown part. And that's what I think makes the magic happen. Because there are certain things, and I believe this from now to the future because of the film, that you have to leave unscripted. You have to leave some unknown part, and you have to choose the right unknown part mm -hmm. out of the equation of control. You know, historically, Martha Graham kept dancing and, and, and choreographing until her 90s. And she was apparently an impossible diva, you know. And she liked to, an like to tip the spirits. And, and Merce, you know, way into his uh, 80s and 90s, yeah. 90s, I believe, was still at, at the bar, so yeah. to speak. Um, I think of people like Judith Renly, who you, neither one of you... I know, I know Judith. You know. We well, took class Judith was, a, was, a, was, a, was an older dancer yeah. among all the young people when the contact improvisation mm -hmm. and that kind of thing happened. And she had a terrible accident. Uh, she got hit by a bus and her, her body was no longer of use to her. Or mm -hmm. Melissa Fenley. I know when, Melissa too. When Melissa had her... ACL on the joystick. stage. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the body only lasts so long. We talked about gymnasts before. They seem to peak at 15. <laughs> we peak at 40. <laughs> well, Same but, thing, but, but, but that <clears throat> means that there is a life of a, of a dancer. But what happens uh, when the body can no longer um, endure the challenges that your work or some of the more extreme choreography that we see today. I'm, and I'm not talking about Spider-Man, although Spider-Man comes into this because I think Julie, Julie Tramer looked a lot at Streb. I actually believed, and I think she would probably say that because she's a generous and... She's and, lovely, yeah. yeah. I, I thought it was an amazing, amazing play, actually. But, but to do that type of complicated eight-point, nine-point flight, mm -hmm. um, they just all they needed was twice as much rehearsal in the theater. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can't afford that. And if you don't know about flying and hardware. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't 
suspect that you need that. They're spending time on the score, on the blocking, on the words, but I thought it was brilliant. I saw the first preview. When, but anyway, you're when, saying... When, when Catherine approached you about wanting to do a project with you, I know that you're friends, and I know that your partners are friends and everything. It's a little community of, of artists that, that know each other. Yeah. But you documented uh, Elizabeth at a particular point in her life. Her company is in place, which also has a kids component. You know, yeah. your, your reputation is established. Uh, um, and yet, what are the challenges that you face today uh, and now that you're becoming a movie star, you know. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what, are, what, are the, what are the challenges that, that, that you are facing today, just in terms of lifespan? Yeah, I mean, for me, because I, I don't adhere to regret or hope or sentimentality. Ah, I, I, sentimentality. None of that. <laughs> I'm not sentimental about how long my body will last. I can do certain things. And I don't do things anymore, but I will let extreme things happen to me. So I trained for that. It's not the same kind of performance, I think, that Merce or Martha did in their elderly years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really not that interested. in The second, in, at age 48, and I'm 64 now, the second I realized people were watching Little Eve saying, Oh my God, she's 48. That was it. Okay. Done. Yeah. And, um, and so I stopped. And I don't see any reason for dance companies to continue, necessarily. I don't see any reason for individuals to keep dancing. Stephen Petronio has just announced that he's going to include younger choreographers in his company rather than carrying this burden as his, he and his body and imagination mm -hmm. ages, but, but saying I have, a rep, I have a company of dancers that, that will bring to life other people's work as well as my own. Mm -hmm. what is, when, did, when you heard about that, did, what did you think? Well, I think that, you know, Stephen is always inventing, always finding new ways to survive, as we all have to in our way. Um, I don't think it's that different than Elvin Ailey. I mean, let's mm -hmm. face it, Elvin Ailey, you know, Elvin Ailey was interested in representing black choreographers from almost the onset of his career. Mm -hmm. And he's maybe known for Revelations and a couple other dances. But I think there's something really smart and futuristic about including more than just one person's ideas on stage. I don't think it works, even with the greatest like Merce Cunningham or Trisha Brown. Mm -hmm. I don't think sitting there for two, three hours watching one person's ideas, even strep, although I try and make it exciting, <laughs> um, I think it's a good idea. Do I think people want to come in a dark theater and sit there for two hours and watch other people dance? I am not sure about that. Mm -hmm. And I think the numbers of audiences no matter how much we rejigger it, will increase, will increase um, in a way that it has to to make this field economically viable for young people flooding out of these colleges. I think our job is to figure out what does action do best and then figure out how to do that. You know, we live in a time where, with, because of all the technology that we have, we have a lot more information about what people do. Right. And extreme sports, you know, uh, is something that is that we all just have to turn on television and there they are doing things which I don't know if the word is magical sometimes it can become magical awesome. but it but it certainly is aggressively fearless oh my lord and how do you as a choreographer as a disciplined artist you know how do you make a distinction between extreme sports and what your company does it's really a question, a great question, and I'm not sure. I tried to decipher the difference between circus and strab for a long time, and I think that their sentences are shorter than mine. You know, I last a little longer, but and in terms of extreme sports, what makes your heart explode? Not you're like, oh my God, how crazy, but what I, I feel that the art of action could be, I'm not saying it is or that I've achieved this, could be the type of thing where you just burst into tears because mm -hmm. of the way it's constructed, mm -hmm. its rhythm, what happens spatially, where they are, what they're doing. I don't think extreme sports does that. I never start crying mm -hmm. when I see someone do I go, whoa, you must be nuts. And I admire it deeply. But the art of action is different. And I hope for higher things aesthetically and um, something that could move a person who spent their whole lives laying bricks or building houses or uh, you know, being on an assembly line or taking care of children or whatever it is, I want a form, an action form, that reaches the masses, not the anointed people who understand mm -hmm. the calibration of choreography. 
Uh, we're about to finish up this interview. I, I, I would love to talk to you for another two hours. But Catherine, um, what, how did this experience change you as a person and as a mom and, and as an artist working with Elizabeth, uh, filming this impossible project that she had and having almost everything go wrong the day of the shoot? <laughs> Well, it was it was interesting. I mean, I don't I don't know. I try to think about what I'm doing next. I have all these ideas and I really to me the opportunity to work with an artist, as you know, the social justice themes of my films and the work and the outreach and everything that's related to every piece I've ever made is much more literal than this one. And although I'm obviously an artist, consider myself an artist and I'm fascinated with art as itself, the focus on the art and culture part has been more imbued and not necessarily the primary element of my work until now. And that allowed me, we were lucky to get, we got an NEA grant to make this movie. We got a huge grant from the Warhol Foundation that doesn't really fund movies, but funds artists and artists work on art. And so in that way, I felt there was a lot of support and understanding and sort of confirmation that what we were doing was right as a way to say, this isn't necessarily a documentary film in the same way that Elizabeth's work isn't dance. Mm -hmm. That it's a little bit of something else. It's related to those things. But it makes me want to explore further uh, exploding the genre of documentary. So we're seeing more and more of that. I mean, when I said so earlier, oh, I don't want to make narratives, there is a way that I could see making something that some people might but, but call come, that. But it would, be a, it would be a document. I mean... But I don't want to just document. But you came out, when I first met you, you were part of the ACT UP... Um, Diva TV. Diva TV, which was all <laughs> advocacy. Advocacy, advocacy work, you know, education, outreach. News reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, news real. Yeah. And, and to make the transition to a documentarian, I mean, it seems to me a lot of young people don't understand what documentaries are supposed to be. I know, they think of reality, too. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 then, and then to break that form, in a sense, is what you're challenging yourself to do now. Uh, I don't want you to leave. I, don't want, I mentioned very early on about one of your documentaries, which I still um, cry when I think about it. Uh, could you in Mexico? Could you please talk a little bit about that? And about people, Ron, I think. Yeah, and it, well, not just about Ron, but about that whole company yeah. and why why you were there and can people see that film today? Well, thank you for connecting it because in the same way that I think there are similarities and important differences between Al Mazel's work on Cristo and this film about Elizabeth in terms of the public art and in terms of a stylistic approach to telling a story of an experience, an artistic public ex outdoor experience. I also think there are all these comparisons to Hallelujah, the Ron mm -hmm. Athey film that I made 20 years ago, partly because it's about a company, it's about performance, but it's not necessarily about putting their performance on film. It's about seeing what happened, how it came to be, and who the people are who do it. And that community is so powerful and was so strong and important to me then. And for that movie, it is a different time. It was the very first movie I ever made, mm -hmm. and this is the most recent one. So you can see it. It's online. It's called Hallelujah. We also have some DVDs that are still for sale. And, mm -hmm. and, and Ron just made this book, this incredible book of photographs that has an essay that I wrote about making the movie. Uh -huh. um, and, but the comparisons to me personally, not maybe for anybody, but maybe you and me, are really powerful because no, it goes to Mexico and how they ended up being able to do what they were doing in Mexico and how unique it was and how there were people who were so drawn. I can't tell you the people that come up after these movies. We were at, premiered internationally at Sheffield and two people who ran the, the woman who ran the Q&A and, and her friend in the audience had been Mary Poppins in the Olympics <laughs> when they oh, right, right, came right. in on the, and their That's gymnasts really and their acrobats. And that was their experience during the Olympics, and they had seen this and then gone and done their version of it. Oh. It was part. She asked the most brilliant question. She was so excited. I mean, all certainly dancers, well, see, and, but athletes, anybody, people who run a triathlon, people who yeah. run a marathon, they know what it's like 
to hold the roof up, to hold the ceiling up, to just say, I can do this for one more minute. And everybody has the capacity to push themselves that way, no matter what they're doing or what their capabilities are. And that is interesting because that, and then also finally in Hallelujah and this one, the relationship of Ron to his company and Elizabeth to her company. They get people to do things. I mean, (laughs) they get people to do things that not everybody would want to do or would ask anybody to do. The the thing that that connects um, this beautiful film, Elizabeth Streb versus Gravity, you know, um, Born to Fly, and uh, Hallelujah, is that my experience of Elizabeth, who I've interacted with over the years and with Ron, who used to, I first met as the fastest typist in Los Angeles. He worked at the, he he worked at the LA Weekly. Yeah, the Weekly. Uh, is that they would uh, ask people to do extreme things uh, and it was hard things. But I, but my own interactions with both of them was that they are the sweetest, kindest. <laughs> I hate to say this and ruin your image, Elizabeth, it's but nice. soft yeah. and <laughs> gentle. And sensitive, and, friendly. and, care, and caring, yeah. and scary, and friendly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank I hope so everyone comes. We'll get a chance to see Born to Fly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very Jim. much. Thank you.